early portions of it anticipate uh, later forms. So it is like a prediction, a self-fulfilling self prediction is what a fractal is. It predicts by virtue of its past states. They define what its future states will be exactly in the same way that I imagine uh, the morphogenetic field defines what future states will be. The fractals that have been talked about to date have been uh, used to describe spatial phenomena, coastlines, molecular arrangements, uh, mm. distribution of flowers in a meadow, this sort of thing. But if instead you thought of, of fractals as descriptors for the temporal dimension and replace the notion of a flat or slightly curved manifold with an actual uh, fractal surface over which events were flowing and flowing over patterns which repeated themselves at many, many levels in resonance with previous similar patterns, then you would begin to have uh, a mathematical picture of how the morphogenetic field would work. And you would also have found a phenomenon in nature upon which to hang it by saying time is obviously it. It's just that we are so ingrained by Newtonianism to accept time as an abstraction, as something not having equal status with the other three dimensions, that we've overlooked this fact. And yet, obviously, that is the carrier wave. That's why you would speak of the presence of the past. What then can it be but time, past time, in the present. Well, it is past time in the present. But the, the fractal wave, you see, the, why I don't like the fractal model taken to any great extreme is because any kind of mathematical modeling, given the whole, kind, the whole nature of mathematics as it's practiced, fractal mathematics is conventional paradigm in the sense that you, you create an equation and you generate this form. The equation itself is not subject the governing equation is not subject to evolution. It's generating the same form, and it would go on generating the same form right into the future. In other words, it would be a kind of determinism based mm -hmm. on a kind of platonic or Pythagorean ideal form, the fractal equation, which generates the fractal. And I don't understand evolution as happening like that. I don't think it's de as deterministic. Well, you're right that as they are presently understood, it would generate, however complicated, ultimately a determinism. But I wonder if we're just not mathematically sophisticated enough to inculcate into the fractal equations sufficient randomness within the fractal constraints to begin to get uh, the kind of complexity that we meet in the real world. That would seem to be what is lacking, is a, a random factor that causes the fractal equation to skew toward production of ferns and then suddenly to switch over to feathers and then to river systems and then to industrial economies or something like that. But if it can do all these things, it can model all these things, but as you say, in a deterministic way. But maybe we don't know enough about them yet and that there may be higher dimensional or higher order fractals with a degree of, uh, of self-determinacy or autopoiesis built into them. Mm. I think this must be so because I think the world we're living in must be such a world and that we are these fractals. We are essentially, th essentially three-dimensional expressions of DNA and all the DNA is the same, and yet each one of us is different, and yet 10 of us are like any other 10, and yet different. And we, as human beings, have the same quality, and so do our cities and our nation states and the continents we inhabit and the religious systems that we're inside of. So it seems to me the fractal model may be the one which holds out the greatest hope for a formalizing of the morphogenetic field, all other fields 
are fractals. The electromagnetic field, the radio wave, all of these things have, are found to have this quality. And in fact, the development of this kind of mathematics initially was in, in an effort to describe the field phenomenon, Fourier transforms and that sort of thing. So then, why not this one? And then that vastly narrows down the mathematical domain in which you have to search for a formal description of the morphogenetic field. It would also yield a perfect theory of history because that would be part of the morphogenetic mm. field. Well, I suppose that one of the problems I have is that I'm not so fascinated with mathematics. I mean, I don't think that mathematics, most mathematicians, think that the maths is more real than the thing it models, that the equations of the universe are more real somehow than the universe. They were there before it, after all. They were its source. They were prior to it, <laughs> both logically and temporally. They're the more real thing. This is the Platonic tradition. Platonism. And this is the, uh, alive and well. I mean, its latest, greatest exponent in the, in the bestseller lists of the last few months is Stephen Hawking, <laughs> who, as a, a perfect exponent, really, of that platonic view of the eternal intellect, the eternal mathematical mind, which somehow is over and above the universe. The mathematical mind of God, in some sense, is there before and prior to matter or bodies. And as one of our British um, journals put it, to that Stephen Hawking is the closest thing we have to a disembodied mind. <laughs> And it's a perfect, you see, in a sense there's a perfect, I think the reason for his mythic quality, because he is a mythic figure, of mythic power, mm -hmm. is because of that. And, and the vision is totally consistent with it. And um, so I don't really, all mathematics tends to have that quality. And I would think of the fields not as something which to grasp we have to model mathematically, but as something which they, I think of them as much more like living things, and our models would be much more and more appropriately based on an intuitive sense, a living sense of things that we actually learn from experience as living things ourselves. So the models would be much more communicated by seeing how they correspond to our actual subjective experiences, the kind of things that we experience. So through ordinary language? Through ordinary language, through the realms of the imagination, through our understanding of memory, through the mind, through the power of hopes, fears, desires, uh, fantasies, through the experience of our consciousness as the realm of the possible. And so these are much the best models. And mathematics is a tiny fraction of a formalized modeling of the possible, which is constrained by very particular rules and is entirely so far in the whole history of the subject under the aegis of the Platonic spirit. And I, I just think that to try and pin it all to that just seems a limitation that one doesn't need at this stage. Um, I mean, it may be helpful, it may be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> My God, I see why they're alarmed now. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, well, I'm sure you're quite right. <laughs> <clears throat> So, so what you're really calling for is the rebirth of poetry. Uh, well, and all kinds of lived experience through which we directly yes. relate to the world. Because